We're in this series all about, uh, it's called Tools I Use. Thank you, Colin. Appreciate that, buddy. I love you, pal. Colin, you're a man of God. I know you share the gospel all the time with people at school. You keep, never stop doing that. Just like you just yelled out right there, it's okay. I know your mom was like trying to be kind, but don't let anybody silence your voice when it comes to preaching. Amen? Never. Psalm 63. I want you to notice the tone of voice. I want you to notice what this author is feeling. Is he, is he happy? Is he sad? Is he joy-filled? Is he broken? I want you to take note of the tone. I, I so wish that I had the tone of voice when we were reading the Bible, you know? It's one of those things. I want to ask Jesus when you said to Peter, get behind me, Satan, like, what was your tone of voice, you know? Anyway. It says this, Oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you. In a dry and weary land where there is no water. So I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and glory. Because your steadfast love is better than life. My lips will praise you. So I will bless you as long as I live. And in your name, I will lift up my hands. It goes on. It goes on. In fact, uh, this passage, David is in this, really a spirit of desperation. Have you ever been desperate before? Like truly desperate. I'm going to preach this message today called Desperate to be Desperate. You ever heard that term, uh, desperate times calls for desperate measures? So I looked it up. I didn't know this, but I looked it up. That first originated 400 years B.C. from Hippocrates, the father of modern medicine. It was actually a medical thing. He said, he said, extreme cases of medical need call for extreme uses of medical practice. And then, of course, we know that people have taken that term and used it, and we still use it today. And we, we basically mean desperate times calls for des- desperate measures. We, we, we can use that in any situation in life where something is, you know, we're desperate and, and, and we'll just do whatever we need to do. Some people have used that at times. They were, they were so broke and they were so hungry that they were desperate. And so they went and they stole some food. Aladdin. <laughs> and others. <laughs> but in any given situation, whether it be finances or relationship or your job or whatever, you might find yourself in a situation where you are desperate. And I'll tell you. Of all of the things that desperation will lead you to do, there's one thing that desperation will never lead you to do. Nothing. Mm. Yeah, that's right. If you're truly desperate, you won't do nothing. I want to ask you, people that live in America who are relatively comfortable in life, Are you desperate for God? Do you recognize and feel your desperation? I'll tell you, David, in this passage, he was probably feeling it. You know when you're feeling it, it's easy to feel it? And when you're not feeling it, it's easy to not feel it? Follow me. Stick with me. So this is the third time that David has found himself in the wilderness. The first time as a young boy, he's out in the wilderness, you know, slinging his slingshot, having fun, singing songs to Jesus, and he's having a great old time. The second time David was in the wilderness was when Saul was trying to murder him, and he was running for his life. The third time David found himself in the wilderness is after he had become king, become the greatest king in Israel's history, and now here at the end of his life, he's in the wilderness once again running This time from his own son who's trying to take over the kingdom via a coup. And that's what's going on when he pens these words. And so 
I think that the tone of his voice and what's going on in him would probably be spoken with a little bit of desperation. He's crying out to God. I want to ask you, when's the last time that you really cried out to God in desperation? I know some of you have. I know some of you are right now for certain situations. But what about you? I'm not talking to the person next to you that's fighting cancer. I'm not talking to the person next to you that is struggling with their finances. I'm, I'm talking to you, comfortable Christian. Are you desperate for God? Because when you feel desperate, it's easy to be desperate. But the truth is, whether you feel it or not, we are all the time desperate for God. Right now, you're desperate for God. I know for me, when I'm not feeling it, because I live in a, a, a quite comfortable life, I recognize intellectually that I am desperate to be desperate. Because when I feel desperate, I am desperate. But when I don't feel it, then I don't think I am. But the truth is, I am desperate. So I'm desperate to be desperate. I'm desperate to feel that. I'm desperate to be in that place where I want to seek him and pursue him and cry out to him. Because when I don't feel like doing that, I know that I still need to. And so I'm going to give you a tool tonight. It's a tool I use. It's a tool we use. And it's a tool that will help you remember that you are actually desperate for God. It will help you remember by helping you feel it. You ready? Fasting. Come on. Raise your hand if you want to fast. Come on. I'm excited. By the end of the night, all of you are going to raise your hand. Come on. Yes. God has used hunger. I don't know why. He just has. It's one of the things that God uses to get a hold of the hearts of his people. It's one of the things that he uses to remind his people of what they should remember. It's one of the things that he uses to stir up a desperation, to stir up an obedience in his people. Listen to this out of Deuteronomy chapter eight. Now, if you don't know the story, this is what happens. God's people found themselves in slavery and then they cried out to God and then God showed up and he delivered them through miracles and then they were passing through the wilderness, supposed to be passing through the wilderness into the promised land, although they distrusted and disobeyed God, so they wandered around for 40 years and then finally he gets a hold of their hearts and leads them to a place where they're ready to obey and he reminds them of this and this is what he says to them in the second giving of the law, which is what Deuteronomy means, by the way, if you're ever wondering, the second giving of the law. He says this, the whole commandment that I commanded you today, shall, you shall be careful to do, that you may live and multiply. Go in and possess the land that the Lord swore to give to your fathers. You shall remember the whole way that the Lord has led you these 40 years in the wilderness. It's so easy to forget what God has done. Human beings have this weird thing of like remembering the things that we are supposed to forget and forgetting the things that we are supposed to remember. And so God uses certain means to help us with that. He says, you shall remember the whole way that the Lord your God led you these 40 years in the wilderness, that he might humble you, testing you to know what is in your heart, whether you should Keep his commandments or not. He humbled you and he let you hunger. He let you hunger. And he fed you with manna, which you did not know. And that word manna means, what is it? And their tone of voice was, what is this? That was called a parcel fast because they ate manna pretty much every day for a long period of time and then quail for a bit, but for about 40 years, they were on a parcel parcel fast. And he made them hunger to humble them and to test them and to remind them of what he had done. And to remind them of this fact. That he might make you know that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word 
that comes from the mouth of God. It doesn't matter how much money you have. It doesn't matter what food you have. It doesn't matter what material possessions you have. You do not live on the things that you possess. You live on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Aren't you desperate to know him more? Aren't you desperate to have more of him? Are you? Really, are you? Are you desperate for him? This is a, this is a, a weird season we're living in. I think we need God. The truth is we always have. No matter who's in office, we're desperate for God. No matter if there's a pandemic or not, we're desperate for God. No matter if you have zero zeros or a million zeros in your bank account, you're desperate for God. No matter if you have food on your plate or you don't or a roof over your head or you don't, you're desperate for God. We are desperate for every word that comes from God. And so God has given us a gift of fasting. What is fasting? Fasting is intentionally choosing to not feed yourself for the sake of seeking God. Let me just give you, I'm, uh, uh, we're going to give you at the end of the night tonight this little booklet on fasting. And uh, if you want one, I'm just going to read a few examples out of this booklet uh, of, of different way, different fasts in the Bible and different things that people have fasted for. Because there's not just one example. Here's one in Judges 20. The Israelites fasted to hear from God regarding whether they should enter into battle, battle or not. They were fasting to seek wisdom. 1 Samuel 31 and 2 Samuel 1, David and the people fasted after hearing about the death of Saul and Jonathan. They were fasting to mourn. Ezra chapter 8, Ezra and the people fasted together to invoke God to grant safe passage. They fasted to seek God's protection. Nehemiah chapter 1, Nehemiah fasted while praying for the forgiveness of sins and to remind God of his promises and to beg for the return from exile. They fasted to petition God. Esther chapter 4, the Jews fasted in preparation for Esther's courageous attempt to approach the king to save her people. They fasted to seek God's favor. A few more. Daniel 9. Daniel fasted and prayed to confess wrongdoing by his people and to petition God for Jerusalem. They fasted for mercy. Joel chapter 2. In Joel, God commanded the people to return to him in repentance through fasting. They fasted to show God their repentant heart. Acts chapter 9. Saul, who would later become Paul, fasted after meeting Jesus on the road to Damascus. He fasted in waiting for what God had next for him. Acts chapter 13. Through fasting and prayer, the people in the church at Antioch knew to set apart Paul and Barnabas for the special work directed by the Holy Spirit. They fasted for guidance and the call. And the examples go on and on and on. Some of the the fasts are absolute fasts. That's everything. Some of them are partial fasts. That's they would choose to eat just vegetables or you know certain certain things or no delicacies or whatever. Um, some fasts are supernatural, um, like Moses. It, you know, I think we believe that he went without food or water for quite a while. And so there's different examples. I think we should take a look at what Jesus thinks about fasting. You think if Jesus has an opinion on something, we should too. All right, last passage, Matthew chapter 6. Let's see what Jesus thinks. Jesus says this, Matthew 6, verse 16 through 18. He says, And when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites. That word hypocrite is, is literally the word for actor. That's, that's the Greek word for stage actor. So, um, he, you know, he's basically saying, don't be a fake. Don't, don't be an actor. And if you read this passage, you'd see that he says the same thing over and over again when he's talking about praying, when he's talking about giving, when he's talking about fasting. You should really read the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5 through uh, 7. It's it's awesome. But here he's talking about fasting. 
He says, when you fast, do not look gloomy like the actors, for they disfigure their faces when they're fasting in order to, this whole section is about motive, in order to be seen by other people. So for Jesus, this whole thing is about motive. Why would you fast? Are you doing it in order to be seen by somebody else? Don't do that. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. In other words, if, if your motivation of your heart is to fast so that somebody will see you fast, then them seeing you fast and them giving you attention, that is your reward. But if the motivation of your heart is, I'm fasting for God, then he becomes your reward. Now I just have to point something out about this because we, we turn to passages like this like probably I used to, because, and we say, well, we can't talk about fasting. We can't even talk about it in church. Nobody, nobody's even allowed to know that we're fasting, but there, there's a balance here, friends, because here's the thing. Pretty much every fast that takes place in the Bible takes place in community. And so I know that like we're individualistic Americans here, and it's like, we want to do our own thing and, and, and pray, but... I'll just tell you, like, historically speaking, it, it, it wasn't like Moses was like, hey, you guys, pray about and talk with your family like what you want to fast. It was like, everybody's going to do this. <laughs> and we're going to do the same thing, okay? And so that's how it was. And so if everybody in the community knew what the fast was, then obviously people knew what each other was doing. The point is, what's the motivation in your heart? Why are you doing it? Are you desperate for God or do you just want attention? Right, and so get your, get your motivation right. And you might be thinking right now, man, it's December, why aren't we just talking about like Christmas and you know, sleigh rides and Santa and presents? And... Because we're desperate for God. And we're preparing you right now. This is the earliest we've ever preached on fasting. And we had this, we had this crazy idea that this year, we're gonna prepare you for January in advance. So I just wanna let you know, there's a season for everything in life. We want you to celebrate well. We want you to eat a whole lot of food this month. Like fill your bellies with it. Eat all the sugar you want and then stop on January 1st, okay? <laughs> no, for real though. Like enjoy it. Like there's times for different things and, and this is a season where we should celebrate and that's good. Get with family, enjoy meals, fill your table and fill your belly. But I wanna prepare you because on January 1st, we're asking every single one of you to remind your flesh that you're desperate for God, not just as an individual, but as part of this family. And we're asking you to fast. And we're starting that fast right after communion on Saturday night, January 1st, right here in this room. A 21 day fast. Jesus says, when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your father who is in secret. And your father who sees in secret will reward you. It's okay to get a reward. He's your reward. And you should want him more. You should be desperate. I'm desperate to be desperate for God. The most interesting thing I think about this passage and what Jesus has to say about fasting is that he just assumes that you'll do it. You catch it? You catch it? Je Jesus gave very little instruction he didn't say, hey, you guys should. He didn't say, I command thee to fast. He's assuming we will. And so if Jesus is assuming something about you, you should probably do it. I like that he didn't add a lot of extra instruction, though. There's a lot of examples throughout the Bible that we have of when and what and how and from what and this and that and the other thing. And, and so I, th I think that's part of God's heart is that he would invite us as a community, as a family, as an individual, that you would start praying right now. God, I, we've already, me and my wife have already started doing that, that with our kids. Starting on Thanksgiving, when we were shoving our faces with food, we started saying, hey, get, get ready kids. On, in January, we're fasting together. And, and they're already starting talking about what they're gonna fast. And so I, I wanna let you know, you can fast from other things, like a lot of times we'll do electronics, 
TV, you know, the kids will do video games and, and you, some people do social media or scrolling or stuff like that. And, and you should and you, you can consider all of those things as well. Anything that maybe is distracting you or that, you know, that maybe has become an idol, you should, should for, for sure fast anything that's an idol. But, but just, just to let you know, biblically speaking, a fast is not Instagram. It's food. And so I get that people have, it just needs to be said in this generation because people, well, I'm going to, I'm just going to fast Facebook. Yeah. Okay, cool. What else? You know, like, that's awesome. That's a great start. <laughs> you know, so for, I, I'm, I, can I just push you a little bit? Like, it's not a sacrifice if it's comfortable. And if it's not a sacrifice, you're probably going to get nothing out of it. Oh, yep, yep. That's right. I challenge you to challenge yourself. Sometimes I hear what people are fasting and I try not to judge them. Because I'm like, really, dude? Like, I've, I, I see you make the sacrifice to get up so you can prepare for that marathon. You, 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 you know how to sacrifice. Sacrifice for God because you're desperate for him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's something that happens in your flesh when you hit that place where you think to yourself, I can't do this. Right. When you are so weak and you're, and, and there's just something special that happens spiritually yeah. when your flesh is starving. Yeah. And if you haven't felt the joy of that feeling and that <laughs> hunger, I'm serious when I say that. If you haven't felt that before, this is your year. Come on. There is a tool that I use that is an invitation to punch your selfishness in the face. Yes. Buffet your body. Buffet your body. Not buffet. Not buffet. Wow. That's good. January 1st, we're starting a 21-day fast. I want to invite you to join us and to begin thinking about and praying about and discussing as a family what you'll do. We're gonna actually give you a moment, like Pastor Radian said, we're gonna give you a moment on uh, Sunday the 26th to actually discuss that as a family or with your small group or whoever you uh, are joining that online experience with. And we're gonna talk about that. We're gonna, we're gonna speak out loud what it is that we're gonna fast and, and make a commitment because that's a good thing. Let me just close with a few thoughts. Number one, this is a desperate time calling for desperate measures. But the truth is, even when we don't feel desperate, we're always desperate for God. And if we don't feel it, we should use tools like fasting to remind ourselves of that fact. Number two, there are many physical, emotional, and spiritual Benefits to fasting. Here's a few physical benefits. Fasting makes your body burn fat. It's called ketosis. Fasting helps your, helps your, gut, health, uh, your gut heal itself. Fasting provokes your body to self-cleaning and detoxification. Fasting causes your body to produce more stem cells. Fasting reduces your risk of type 2 diabetes by improving your insulin sensitivity. Fasting uh, slows aging, and fasting reduces inflammation in your brain and on your love handles. Some really good physical benefits, but those honestly are just frosting. Remember that a fast without prayer and seeking God is just a diet. And you could diet all year long and never really pursue God. And that's the most important thing about this fast is that we're inviting you not just to stop eating food, but to replace that time and that filling and that pleasure with moments and opportunities and feelings of pursuing God in prayer and in worship. And you see what I'm saying? It's important, important distinction. We're not asking you to diet. Fasting without devotion is just a diet. 
take a book on your way out if you want one. Uh, it's a really great book that we put together on more teaching on fasting. And then the whole second half of the book is an amazing teaching on prayer that we borrowed from Church of the Highlands. And so uh, we only have 250 of these printed right now. And so we got plenty of time before the first, so we'll have more, we'll print more. So if you want to take a physical copy today, can we just do one per household? And then also for the digital lovers in the, in the house, just go to the front page of our website and you can download the PDF and keep it on your phone or put it on your tablet or whatever. And you, could, you can download that as many times as you want, feel free. But just take one today and then we'll print more throughout the month as we need them. Lastly, I wonder if I could have your permission to just share a prophetic thought uh, that I, I really felt like I heard from the Lord. And it's gonna, ch- it's gonna be challenging, but I, there's hope at the end of this. Is it okay if I share this with you? Yeah, totally. I'm just gonna try and, um, I guess just say it like I felt like I heard it. And I think one of the ways, one of the ways that, that God expresses the prophetic gift through me is maybe different than other people, but one of the ways is generally through look, like looking at society and the church and sort of having this view of what God is doing and what the reality of the situation is. And this is what I felt like the Lord showed me. And it's maybe not necessarily our church or you individually, but I would say it like this, just Christians in general. I, f- I feel like what he was showing me is that there is sometimes a very thin line between those who are saved and unsaved. And that what the last 18 months has revealed to us is that the fruit, the fruit that comes out of some Christians looks a whole lot like the fruit that comes out of an unsaved pagan. And so I'm not saying that those people aren't saved. It's not for me to judge. What I'm saying is that I think that what the last 18 months has revealed to us is that some of us, when we face stress, when we face persecution, when we face struggle or sickness or not getting our way politically, that what flows out of us looks a whole lot like what is flowing out of the world. And that should be cause for alarm in the church and so while I believe and I think I've expressed to you that every human being throughout all of history has all the time been desperate for the spirit of God if I could say it like this I think right now more than ever those that call themselves Christians are really really desperate to be filled with the spirit of God that we would overflow with the fruit of his spirit, no matter what's going on, because I even, and I'm not just pointing my finger, I'm looking at my own, I'm looking at my own actions and I'm, and I'm analyzing, this is what's coming out of you, Craig, like what is that really saying about what's inside? And it's just easy for us to act like we're good Christians when time, times are, you know, stable, but like times have been chaotic and stressful and what's coming out of God's people? We need to overflow with the Spirit of God. And the only way we can overflow with His Spirit is if we are filled with His Spirit. And one way that we can be filled with His Spirit is through fasting. And so I hope that you would consider joining us. And we're preaching about it right now at the beginning of December to give you a lot of time to consider that.